Hello, everybody. Welcome to our our lesson tonight. We're going to have a good one, I think. Um, it's going to be a lot. Richard, you are uh, you are live on your mic. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, all right, Ed, you are live on the mic. You might want to either mute it temporarily. If you mute it yourself, then you'll be able to turn yourself back on. So um, we're going to start uh, a really good lesson tonight, and, and I want everybody to um, participate as much as is possible, um, because we, we want you to uh, join in. And if you see that you're uh, over there with a the mic and all that kind of stuff, you, you would be able to talk. If anybody wants to talk, just let me know and we'll, uh, we'll promote you up. Um, if you want to turn your webcam on so everybody can see, you can do that too. So praise the Lord. Well, we are here virus free tonight and um, nobody being ill. And we are having an opportunity to um, talk about the word of God without worrying about all the fears that the the uh, the country's putting out there. So that's a good thing. So let's get started. We want to pray for a couple of things. First of all, we want to pray for Steve. Steve, as you know, he went in, he had a procedure done where they put a pacemaker in and, and did the uh, mapping thing on his heart to stop his heart from beating incorrectly. And then the um, they also now are going to go in and shock his heart because he's still having some the two things that he was having went away, but now he's an AFib. So they want to shock that and get that back in the right place. So we want to um, be praying for him and, and lifting him up, him up, as well as all the other folks that are just experiencing so many different things. And um, we, we, we want the Lord to, to move in, and move clearly on everyone so that uh, I mean, I want to hear about miraculous healings. I want to hear about people who they, they went to bed sick and they, they woke up and they were they were healed. And, and that's just the way it ought to be with believers. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll see um, our lesson for tonight. Oh, yeah. Sister Sue, our Sue sister, Sally. Let's be praying for her as well. Sally uh, had a mastectomy. She is going through healing. She's um, they're debating now on chemotherapy and some other things. Uh, be praying for her uh, because that that's rough treatment. And and then Sarah is recovering. She had uh, just last week her gallbladder removed, and she's recovering from that. She had a, a huge gallstone that was clogging up the works, um, and she needs. I mean, the Lord really took care of her, a good doctor, and she needs to have um, some recovery there. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you for your healing. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for touching everyone who has been through a surgery, from Sarah to, to Sally to, to Steve. Um, Father, for Kay, we will pray for her. She's still in recovery, Lord God. Uh, from the procedure she had done on her heart. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray in the name of Jesus that there would be a supernatural recovery in each and every one of these folks, Lord God, that your anointing would be upon them, that the power of God would, would overshadow them. And Father God, that they would feel your presence, that they would know the touch of your hand upon them, Lord God, because by the stripes of Jesus, they are healed. And we thank you and we praise you for it. Father, we pray for the people of Messiah Community Church. Father, we pray a hedge of protection around each and every person that regardless of who they come in contact with, regardless of what people are saying, Father, that they'll, they'll not be touched by any of this coronavirus stuff, Father, or the flu or strep throat or any of the other things that are floating through the air. No wonder he's called the prince in the power of the air, Father, because there's so much stuff floating around that people are catching, Father. But it, it might fall to our left and fall to our right, but it'll not fall on us. And so we just speak over us, Lord God, that the enemy has no power or authority over us, that we are 
protected and healed in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we, we claim over your people, Lord God, that Jesus is their healer, that, that everything was accomplished on the cross. And then, Father God, because of that, Jesus now sits at the right hand of, of our Heavenly Father, making intercession for us, Lord God. And the thing he prays for us is that we are 100% walking in divine health. And we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's get started. We've got a lot of ground to cover tonight and a, and a really good bit of information. I want to start where I left off last week and just kind of cover these because I kind of hit them really fast. But I want you to grab hold of this because this leads us to the next part. In Genesis 17, 1 and 2, it says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. He didn't say he's going to multiply him a little bit. He said he's going to multiply him exceedingly. Now, when he says exceedingly, he means exceedingly, um, abundantly above. Um, overflowing, overwhelming. So he he talks to God that way, or, or God talks to Abram that way, and he he says he is God. That's very important. He says the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, "I am Almighty God." The Lord, as Abram sees him, because this is um, this is the Lord appeared to Abram. This isn't. It doesn't say in a vision. So this isn't a vision. This is a physical appearance of the Lord. Well, we know it isn't God. God, like I, I heard um, oh, one pastor that we had come into Messiah one time, older fella, uh, Johnny James, Dr. Johnny James. Uh, and he said, God's so big that if God moved, he, he'd bump into himself and destroy the world <laughs> because he's so big. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't God Almighty. This is coming to Abram, because this is a, a person who comes to Abram, and it says, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him. So this is a, an appearance of Jesus. And he says, I am almighty God. Wow. <laughs> Jesus is here telling Abram, listen, the person you see, it's almighty God. And he says, walk before me and be blameless. Now, when he says walk before me, and be blameless, he isn't talking about that Abraham will, won't ever sin, or that there's, um, there isn't anything that Abram's going to do um, as far as being perfect before him, because he, he can't be. He's going to walk before him and be blameless. Now, what he's going to be blameless in it is, is his belief about God. Now, he doesn't know at this point in time anything about the Ten Commandments or anything about the rules of, of law, the law of church, you know, the law of church. Don't smoke, drink, cuss, or run around with women. You know, he, Ab Abram doesn't know that because it hasn't been spoken yet. So when he tells him, walk before me and be blameless, he is saying, walk before me and be blameless. The, the be blameless part is... Let me be God. Treat me that way. Talk to me that way. Believe me, don't go back to idol worship. Don't believe other gods of this world. He's not talking don't sin. He's saying don't, don't put me off as not God. I am God. And that's the reason why he introduces himself that way. And he says, and I'm going to make a covenant between you and me. And we'll multiply you. So in the covenant, in the covenant he makes with Abram right here is multiplication exceedingly. Now, this isn't just talking about having kids. This is talking about in every way possible. Now, in Genesis 17, 5 through 6, he says, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. Now, here, here he is talking about family, children. When it, whenever God talks about being fruitful, he's talking about increase of, of your children, your seed. And I will make nations of you. Clearly there, he's talking about his, his heirs, the, the people that are going to come after him. And kings 
shall come from you. So not just is he going to make nations, but kings are going to come out of him. Now, you notice here, and, and I showed you this last week, but I, I think it maybe was a little too quick. You see here the, the letters Aleph, Bet, Resh, and Mem. That's Abram. And the vowels are the little points in that that, that tell you what vowel it is. And then he changes it. He changes it to the same name, but you'll notice he adds in right before the, the first letter over on the left, he adds in that little thing that looks kind of like a hook with a little line. Looks a little different in ancient Hebrew. This is kind of modern Hebrew. Uh, the uh, the font is a kind of a more modern Hebrew. But that that's a hey. The hey is, a le- is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It is the letter of grace. The word literally, hey, that letter literally stands for to reveal or revelation. So it became known as the letter of grace because when people have a revelation of God, when they know who he is, when they have a revelation of him, a, a revelation goes beyond just knowing, hey, that guy over there is God. A revelation is knowing, hey, that their guy is God Almighty. He is the, the omnipotent one. He's an understanding of not just his name or not just uh, be able to picture him that, oh, that's him. But it's much bigger than that. It's a, it's a revelation of who he is in his total persona. So the hey is added. So the only thing that changes with Abram when he says, yeah, I'm going to make you a, a father of many nations. Um, the only thing that was missing in him was favor, grace. So God adds grace to him. Then in Genesis 17, 15 through 16, then God said to Abraham, knows he's called Abraham from here on out, to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give her give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Now, here we find the same transformation. Her name was Shin Resh Yad or Yud. Shin going from the right to the left. Literally consumed the door with work. It's it's changed to Shin Resh He. Literally consumed the door with grace. So as a woman, she is the door by which the promise is coming. She was trying to work to get the promise to come before. Her, her whole idea was, well, man, I got to do this, got to do this, got to do this. Man, no, no kid. No nation. No kings coming from me. Hey, I got an idea. Hagar, come here. You're kind of cutesy. You go with my husband. When you become pregnant and you go to deliver the child, you're going to deliver the child into my lap. That way, that child will be mine. That was Hebrew custom at the time and custom of the other nations around. And it didn't work either. God said, wait a minute, that's that's not what I promised. What I promised was, Sarah, you will have a baby. Abram will have a baby. So God adds grace to Sarai, and she becomes Sarah. What was she missing to have that child? Grace. She couldn't have it by works. Gotta, gotta have it by grace. Now look at Genesis 17, 16 through 19. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her. Yeah, even in the Old Testament, they doubted God, right? Uh, uh, make her Uh, mother of many nations, kings of people shall come from her. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abram said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. He's, He's still thinking. Then God said, no, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call him his name Isaac. Isaac, by the way, literally means laughter. I will establish my covenant with him 
for an everlasting covenant in his descendants and with his descendants after him. So God's still sticking with the promise he made here. There's no doubt in God. There's doubt in Abraham and Sarah, but there's no doubt in God. Abraham laughs here, and we're going to see Sarah also laughs at, at a point when God reminds her of the promise that he made and says that she's going to have this kid. She also laughs. They're just laughing people. And, but but the laughter with Abraham it is not a laughter of laughing at God. Get that? He's not laughing at God. He's laughing with God. What did Jesus tell us? I came that your joy might be full. It's a promise. He's telling Abraham here, I'm going to give you the child I promised you. Abraham laughs about it, but but he's not laughing from a standpoint of, yeah, go ahead, God. I can't believe this. He He's laughing from a standpoint of, man, can, can I still do this? Can this still happen when I'm 100 years old? With the woman that I love and the one that's the promised one. In this exchange with Jesus, Abraham asked for his son, Ishmael, to be a great nation. God complies with Abraham's request. But Ishmael not to be the promised son. He says, hey, OK, listen, I'm, I'm going to make him a great nation, too, because he is your son. You ask me. It's not going to work out well for you long term. But you ask me. And, and you ask me to have grace on it. I'm going to. Here we see the impossible woman past her time of childbearing compared with Mary, a woman who doesn't know a man conceiving. Now, think about this. I, I hadn't thought about this really in this way until I was studying for this lesson. We have two extremes. We have uh, Sarah, who is past her time of conceiving. She's way too old. I mean, she's 90 years old. She's way past. She's probably not dropping eggs or anything at this point in time. And, and well past the, the, the menopause period. And, and here she is. She's not even sure that Abraham and her can, you know, make babies. So she's impossible. Here's Mary on the other end of the spectrum. A young girl, all estimates say she was somewhere between 15 and 16 years old, marrying Joseph, who was probably in his uh, mid to late 20s. It was kind of the custom in Israel at the time. So she's she's in that time period and she doesn't know a man. So here we have the two opposite ends, both having a child of promise. Which brings us to the point when it says. With God, all things are possible. God is going to prove himself. Listen, God is proving himself all the way through the Bible. When, when he did this with Sarah and Abraham, what he's telling the whole world and what he's telling the nation of Israel is what I say, it doesn't matter how impossible it is. It's going to come to pass because I want it to come to pass. God can do whatever God wants to do anytime God wants to do it. Abram laughs, Sarah laughs at the same pronouncement. The thought of God telling us things that are going to happen. Yeah, Mike, exactly. Isaiah tells us that, that the Savior is going to come from a virgin. She had to be a, a pure woman. And never knowing a man before in, in a biblical sense. So God uses impossible circumstance to bring to pass the things that he wants to happen in the possibility. And he creates a lot of joy in the process. God establishes his covenant with man through Abraham to bless the nations through Abraham. This covenant is an everlasting covenant. Now this speaks to the level of commitment by Yahweh to those who accept him as their God. There are no conditions. When Abraham tells, uh, when, he, when he talks to Abraham, when God talks to Abraham and tells him he's going to make him a great nation, he's going to give him all this property, there are no preconditions. There are no conditions that Abraham has to follow except for allow God to be God. 
That's all. Now, the, the level of commitment he places, God places a lot of commitment on himself and no commitment on Abraham. And he doesn't make a commitment. Think about this now. At this point in time, he's given the children of Israel all of Abraham's seed for generations. It, it, it keeps going because God said an everlasting covenant. I mean, he's going to go forever, right? He places that on Abraham with no conditions. There is no law. There isn't anything that they have to do. There isn't anything they have to follow. There isn't anything that, you know, this is a must be. None of that is in existence at this point in time. All Abram has to do is believe God. That's all. Man, think about that in connection with our faith. Think about that in connection with our faith. If, if our faith is like it's supposed to be, if our faith is everything that we believe it is, we have one thing to do, believe God. Yeah, and exactly, just like we believe in Jesus. Think about that for we believe. Think about how hard church, religion, Christianity, denominations have made it to be a believer, to have the promises of God. We have all kinds of preconditions and then all kinds of conditions after that we believe, right? Got to do this. Got to do that. Got to got to follow through with this. Well, you got to live this way. Got to live that way. Can't wear this. Can't wear that. Got to go this time. Got to go that time. When everything that God has given us to do is not a condition of his love to receive his love. It's not a condition to receive his grace. It's not a condition to receive his healing. None of it is that. But everything that God tells us about how to live, which by the way, in case you hadn't picked up on it, the Gospels tell us what Jesus did. The epistles tell us how to live that out. Now, part of how to live that out is not how to live it out is, is step A, step B. Oh, you missed step C. You got to go back or you're going to get punished. That isn't the way the epistles are written. The epistles are all written as love letters to the church. To tell the church, to tell the body of Christ, to tell the individual believer how that they can experience the best that they can experience by faith. Not by works, by faith, by believing and trusting God and rest all the way through it. That's what this was intended to be. Yeah, Mike says if they had a connection with the Almighty, then they wouldn't have had the Ten Commandments. That's exactly right. The, the commandments come in because they didn't, they didn't have that connection, because they didn't believe in the vein of Abraham. What are we told to do? We are told that we are believers like Abraham. We believe God and it's accounted to us as righteousness. We believe in Jesus Christ and everything that Jesus Christ did on the cross, everything that happened when he was crucified, punished, and, and all the wrath of God was laid upon him, went to the grave, rose from the dead, and, and went in, and sat down at the right hand of his father. We're told to believe that. And that's it. In believing that, it's accounted to us as righteousness. That's what salvation is. It's us believing and that being accounted to us as righteousness. We are placed in a place of righteousness, all because of what Jesus uh, accomplished through all the different phases of him being here, being the perfect human sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. Yeah, Ed, think, Ed writes, or you can, you can lose your salvation. Yeah, that is the, the, you can lose your salvation threat. If we, if we have a big threat in, in all of religion, it's the, you can lose your salvation threat. Now, either you are saved or you are not saved. Either you've given your life over the Christ or you have not. There are a lot of people who have a lot of good scripture. Um, Mike says, if you never have something to lose, how could you lose? Yeah, that, yeah Mike, if, if you never earned it, right? 
if it if it wasn't yours to begin with, how can you lose it? If it's God's to give by grace, you can't lose it because he's going to keep on top of you. That's the reason why the word says he's always married to the backslider. I'll never leave you or forsake you to the uttermost parts of the earth, all the way to the end of things. He's never going to leave us nor forsake us. Now, Jesus declared that his salvation bought by his own blood is an everlasting covenant. God says to Abraham that he has an everlasting covenant. Now, Israel broke the rules too many times to count, but God's covenant is still there. In fact, in Romans eleven twenty six, 26, it says, all of Israel shall be saved or will be saved. All of Israel will be saved. How can some in the faith make salvation so hard to hang on to? I think I just had a discussion um, at Don Andriaco's funeral. I had a discussion uh, with with the gentleman. And, and, and I said, you know, I said one one of the uh, biggest lies told from the pulpits of, of America and I'm sure around the world is that you have to keep your salvation. It's up to you to keep it. You better work hard to keep it. You, you got to keep it. You have to do this. You have to do that to keep it. I said, that's that's one of the biggest lies that's ever been known to anybody. Look at Genesis 17, 10 through 13. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall, must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Now, he tells Abraham that this isn't a, um, that this is what God gives Abraham to say, this is my covenant, which you shall keep. It's the thing Abraham's got to do. Be circumcised. That's all. It's, it's a sign that he believes. It's, it's not in order to have the covenant. God gives him that covenant. He says, this is a covenant which you shall keep. This, this part, be circumcised. Now, there's a reason for this. We see the sign of the covenant. It's, it's not a condition of the covenant. It's a sign of the covenant. This is a cutting away the excess flesh, our lust. There is a reason only males are circumcised, because they produce the seed that's corrupt. It's on the eighth day, is that is thought to be the day of the fall. Now, we don't know exactly when the fall could have been. It could have been the eighth day, it could have been the you know 27th day, it could have been 10 years later after they were in the garden. What we do know is it was soon after they were in the garden. Adam and Eve sinned sometime after the seventh day. On the days when men begin to, to live life, they begin to sin, which is what it's thought about Adam and Eve, that when they first began to live, yeah, Ed, there was no Nov Cain back then or morphine or anything else I know, that I know of. Um, the Adam and Eve sinned when they began to live life. Circumcision on the eighth day is a reminder that we are flesh and the works of our flesh have corrupted our seed. That was the whole point of circumcision. And, and that's if you read any of the midrashes written by the rabbis um, through time, you, you find that they were. This was one of the points that they were making. Yeah, and I, I don't know about that one. I wish I did. I, I I never never thought about that because the baby doesn't babies don't get any blood from the mom or the dad. That they, they produce their own blood, um, and and I don't know what it has to do with as far as their body. I, I'm I'm not sure about that. Um, 
But we do know is from a spiritual point, it was a reminder to Abraham and all of his people after him that the males are the responsible party for things being corrupted to begin with. It was Adam's job to protect Eve. It was Adam's job to watch over her. It was Adam's job to make sure that um, he didn't need and she didn't need of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam should have followed through with that. And then once he did eat, he shouldn't have eaten. Once uh, he did eat and God confronted them, he should have fessed up and he shouldn't have blamed his wife. But he, he threw blame on her. So she gets relief. And it's only males that don't get cir- circumcised. The, I mean, it's only women that females that don't get circumcised. The male gets circumcised because it is a reminder that his lust of his flesh it is what got him in trouble. Now, later, after Christ comes, circumcision is used by those bound under law as a tool of judgment. Flesh is used as a measure of flesh, if you can believe that. Um, and, and in fact, Paul writes about it. And we see here in Galatians 6, 12 through 15, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh. Notice what he said. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh. What, it's a, what is it about then? Flesh. These would compel you to be circumcised. Now, he's talking to believers here. Listen, the Hebrew people were the only ones that circumcised each other. They were the only ones that were circumcised. The the Gentile world was not. Now, there are medical reasons today, diseases and things like that, why you would want to be. And that's kind of a whole other interesting subject when you get into it. for cleanliness reasons and for for disease prevention reasons, there's there's a lot of good reasons there for all of that, but that's not that's not what he's talking about. Hold on one second. I'm I'm trying to get my dad online. Uh, tell him they should have he should have gotten an email. If he didn't get an email, tell him to go to our website okay. and go to the one for Wednesday, and it's right there at the bottom of, of the message there. All he's got to do is click on it, and it should log him in. Um, so when, he, when we're talking here in, in the New Testament about circumcision, it's this is still the same thing. Um, He says, for not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. You see, circumcision then has become a work of the flesh. And by the flesh, we're judging flesh. For God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. So God isn't looking here for you to be circumcised or uncircumcised as a male in order to um, in order to prove anything, in order to be saved, in order to to gain salvation or earn salvation. It, it, none of it is about that. But instead, what he's doing here is Paul is really clarifying this. And he's saying, listen, in Christ, there is neither circumcised nor uncircumcised. It doesn't make any difference to God. We're not we're not looking any longer at reminding men. Here we go. That we're not looking any longer at reminding men of their failure in the garden and how sin comes about the excess of the flesh. We're not we're no longer looking at at trying to hammer men with that thing. Instead, what we're doing is we're telling people that, hey, in Christ, circumcision, uncircumcision doesn't make any difference. It's all on the cross. The only thing that matters is the new creation. The new person in Christ is all that matters. We don't have to keep reminding you every day, which is which is really what this was about in the time of Abraham and what God how God distinguished the difference between the nation of Israel and the men of Israel and everybody else. Now, Colossians 2, 11 through 14, in the original uh, Aramaic version, says this. 
and you are circumcised in him by circumcision that is without hands, in the putting off the body of sins by the circumcision of the Messiah. There's some good writings on this too, that because Jesus was circumcised the eighth day, well, Jesus surely did not have to be reminded of the sins of, of men's flesh or the failure of men. He didn't need to be reminded of that, but he did it in obedience to the law. Yeah, Ed, exactly. It was just as a sign to men as believers are, as a Hebrew. Yeah, that's all it was. But now, I mean, we find we find some medical uh, reasons why we do that. And, and for the most part, the United States is one of the only nations that has that um, that practice. And I mean, Great Britain does as well for the most part. And but a lot of the European nations and definitely the African nations and over through the Asian nations, they do not. That, that's not a common practice. But in the nations that were founded in Christianity or through, uh, you know, the, the excursions of, of the Hebrews and nations where the spread of the gospel went. Yeah, it's a common practice. Take a look here. And you were buried with him in baptism. Notice the progression here. You're circumcised with circumcision not made with hands, putting off the body of sins by the circumcision of the Messiah. So the Messiah, him going through the circumcision, that, that did it for us. And you were buried with him in baptism, and in it you arose with him because you believed in the power of God who raised him from among the dead. And you, who had died by your sins and by the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has given you life with him and all for, and, and has forgiven us all our sins. And he has blotted out by his authority the bill of our debts, which, are, which was adverse to us. And he took it from the midst and nailed it to his cross. And you get all that? I mean, what a word there. That, that's a great word for us. Jesus did it all. And here Paul lays it out. The Messiah took care of the circumcision part, the reminding us every day of our excess needs of our flesh and the failure of man. He, he, he says, listen, Jesus took care of that. Boom. Yeah, exactly, Mike. The circumcision now is not of the flesh, but it's of the heart. Because that's where that's where the excesses of your flesh are today. It's in our heart. And then he says, we're buried in baptism. So baptism takes us into the same grave. The whole point here is that our our physical body, our physical being, our physical us are no longer subject to sin. Now, it's hard for us to believe because we sin all the time, you know, but we, we fail all the time. But we're not supposed to focus on the failures because every failure this second is gone the next second. Because God has cast all of our sin as far as the east is from the west from us. If we hang on to what happened yesterday and, and 10 minutes ago, we're in trouble. Look at Genesis 18, 1 through 4. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre. And as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day, so he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, Lord, my Lord, if I had now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Now, this is clearly Jesus again with two angels. And he's clearly recognized by Abraham. I mean, Abraham's already seen him several times. And when this guy and two other guys, right? Mike says, as believers are baptized of his death and baptized in the resurrection. Exactly. We're, we're baptized into his death and, and also we're risen again in resurrection, right? We're, the resurrection of Jesus. We're, we're risen. So we're in the new life where 
circumcision isn't isn't a point anymore. The church, though, does like to beat us up with it, right? Likes to beat us up. Well, you, you just live in the flesh. How many sermons have you heard about living in the flesh? Well, there, I got an answer for people. Living in the flesh is not living, smoking, drinking, and cussing. Living in the flesh is living, not believing Jesus took care of it all. Still relying upon your flesh. Still relying upon your works. That's living in the flesh. Living in the spirit. Living in the spirit is believing God did all that. And as a result, all the stuff, all the stuff that men fall to, you just don't want to do. You, you want to live in a higher plane of life. And you are capable of it because of what the Holy Spirit gives you. Here in Genesis, Jesus is meeting. He walks up with two angels. Abraham immediately recognizes the one, Jesus. He says, hey, sit down here. If I found favor, why is he wanting favor from him? Maybe because he, he recognized he got blessed when, when he beat the kings. He came back, Melchizedek met him, and he blessed him. Genesis 18, 10 through 15. And he said, I will certainly return to you. This is the Lord talking according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. She was already through menopause. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? She's thinking, we're not going to get it on. And, and it's not going to happen. Abraham's old. I'm old. There's not going to be any pleasure in any of this stuff. You know, but should I have it? If the Lord can make that happen, woohoo! I mean, she, she's, she's happy about that. The Lord's given her joy over just thinking about it. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. You're right, Mike, there wasn't. It hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> the, the help, the help drugs were not invented yet. But Sarah denies it, saying, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. God isn't condemning Sarah here. Listen, the, God isn't laying a condemnation on Sarah. He wants this to be a joyful experience for her. Why else would he tell them to name this child Isaac. Isaac means laughter. Because it is the dream of their hearts. It's the desire of their life. It is the thing they've been hoping for. It's the thing they had been believing God for. It is the thing that they left Ur the Cowdies for. Believing God all the way. They never left track of what the promise was. Abraham kept reminding God of it. God kept reminding Abraham of it. It was going to happen. Now Sarah's laughing. Man, is this really going to happen? Wow, she she's laughing about it. Abraham's laughing about it. No wonder God said, hey, listen, this kid, you're going to name him Isaac, laughter. Look at Hebrews 11, 11 through 12. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. You get that? We look back and we find Sarah laughing at what God said. Hebrews, when Paul writes this, he says, listen, she wasn't laughing, judging God unfaithful. She was laughing, judging God faithful. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky and multitude innumerable as the sand of the sea that's by the seashore. Commentary on Sarah's action after the fact. The account doesn't imply she believed God as far as being all in. She, the, the account back in Genesis doesn't lead you to believe that Sarah was all in from our English language reading of it. However, a careful reading of her reply in Hebrew tells us she laughs because of her belief that it could happen. She laughs because of what she believed. 
Ed, you're right. The spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. That's a good point. The spirit, her spirit was willing. Abraham's spirit was willing. That's why, that's why he went with Hagar. Hey, if it's going to happen, I mean, you know, come on, she can do it. Sarah can't. Genesis 18, 7 through 19. And the Lord said, since this is all in the same time frame here, the Lord's still with Abraham. He's already told Sarah he's coming back. She's going to have a child when, when, when he returns. Then he's already talking to Abraham and he's telling Abraham, hey, you know, I'm here. My promise is still going to happen and all that. Then God goes to walk away. The two men that were with God, that are with Jesus, the two men, they're told to go ahead and leave, go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. They take off to go there. Of course, we find them later, two angels coming into the town, the men of Sodom saying, give us those men that we might know them in a, you know, in a biblical sense, know them. And, and so he's, these two guys go. The Lord turns, he's going to leave. And he thinks to himself, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. This direct face-to-face meeting with the Lord and Abraham should open the eyes of every believer to know what kind of intimate relationship that God had, A, with Abraham. But if we are Abraham's seed, according to the promise, as the scriptures tell us, then we are also having an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's this kind of relationship. Yeah, Mike, that, that's a great point, Mike. We all think of our flesh and physical situation instead of believe the promise of God. We sure do. We sure do. Look at 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Yeah, Enoch was all in. That Enoch's a great point. We forget about Enoch a lot because it was a, like, you know, a little un poco scripture about Enoch. Enoch walked with God, and he was, and he was not. And, and it says in Scripture, throughout Scripture, it talks about Enoch and being a, a man of righteousness and, and walking uprightly before God, believing God, and, and God just took him. And he'll come back, I believe, in the end, because I think he's one of the, one of the prophets <laughs> from the book of Revelation. Look at 2 Corinthians 3.18. 3, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, is being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We don't have a veiled face. We don't have anything keeping the truth from us. We don't have anything that God is hiding from us. We have an unveiled face. That's what God was talking about with Abraham. Shall I hide this from Abraham? Should I put a veil over Abraham's face? Should I let him wonder about what came down and destroyed the Sodom and Gomorrah? No, I'm, I'm not. I'm going to tell him. I'm going to share it with him. And of course, we know that there is a conversation that ensues after that. And, and I'll get to that next week. But here, here we have Abraham having a face to face with Jesus Christ. And, and he's talking to him face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And God is sharing with him intimate details about his plans. Let's take a look at the New Testament, because this is all types and shadows of where we ought to be today and how we ought to understand our salvation and our relationship with God. I think too much of our relationship is understood through the eyes of the law, through the eyes of Moses. Now, that that period of time, we're going to get to that as, as we venture on and we get to the book of Exodus. We're going to start getting to some of that through Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, where we find Jesus pictured in there. All of that stuff had to be in order to give us more and more information about the salvation that we are to have in Christ. This kind of thing that Paul's talking about here, remember, Paul was caught up in the heaven for three days. 
And it says he saw things it wasn't lawful for him to speak about. Why? Paul, Paul had tremendous insight. First of all, he was a Hebrew scholar, a scholar among scholars. It, it's written about him. And he's looking into the heavens and he's seeing things as they really are. And I'm sure what he's seeing is the Hebrew scriptures exploded before him in great revelation about how Jesus fulfills it all. And it's all the promises of God. Second Corinthians, he tells us we have an unveiled face. We behold in the mirror the glory of the Lord. How are we going to find out about what God has promised for us? We're not going to find out about it by by by. Uh, reading books, or by doing other things. We're going to find out about it by looking into the face of Jesus. We're not going to find it in religion. We're going to find it by looking into the face of Jesus. The church, the body of Christ, the ministers of, of God that are supposed to be there are, are helpers to get us to in, encourage us and build us up, building up of the body of Christ, right? The building up, the edifying of it, build us up so that we look into the scriptures to find out for ourselves this kind of relationship. Well, Dad, I'm glad you finally made it on. God bless you. Um, and we've had a we've had a good one too. Um, look at these things here in in John 14. Jesus is speaking. He says, "These things I have spoken to you while still present with you." But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, when he says I'm going to send him in my name, he, he doesn't mean I come in the name of Jesus. That, that's not, He coming with the full authority and knowledge of the Father and Jesus. The Holy Spirit's coming with the full authority of heaven. He's bringing all the knowledge, all the authority of heaven. And I'll show you another scripture on that in just a second. He will teach you all things. Who's going to teach you all things? He. Who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to teach you all things. That's why it is so important for believers to get baptized in the Holy Ghost, for them to pray in tongues, for them to pray in the Spirit as often as possible, for them to pray over the scriptures that they're reading in the Spirit, because the, the Spirit reveals the deep things of God. He speaks to us in ways our mind can't comprehend, but we'll get it through the Spirit. He will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So he's talking to the disciples here and he says, listen, the Holy Spirit's going to teach you all things. And not only is he going to teach you all things, but he's going to bring to your remembrance the things that you're taught. Take a look here at Matthew 10, 26 and 27. Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. In what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. Jesus is talking here to his disciples and he's saying, hey, don't fear, the, fear these rabbis and, and these Pharisees and Sadducees and the scholars. And don't fear any of these people. I'm going to teach you more than you've ever dreamed possible of knowing about your heavenly father, about how life is here on the earth, about what you're supposed to know and, and understand. It changed their lives radically. None of them were afraid to die, for one thing. Not one of them. They weren't afraid to die. They weren't afraid to give their life. They weren't afraid to preach. They weren't afraid to lay their hands on the sick in a public place. They weren't afraid to preach the gospel at every place that they, they went to. They weren't afraid to call themselves Christians. Because they believed God. And they knew it was being accounted to them as righteousness. Now take a look here at Colossians 2. Two through three. Ed, that is an excellent point, by the way. Under when when it talks the word understanding, two words, understanding. You are under a standing. When you go to court, it, in order to sue, you have to have a standing. You have to have a standing. I don't know how to get my dad to have sound again. Um, pray for him. Um, in order to have a standing, you cannot. That that means you've got a stake in the case. You you there's something in order to have standing. You have to have a stake in the game you're suing about. That's the reason why you hear it in some court cases. Well, they they couldn't do that because they didn't have any standing. You know, you can't sue if you haven't been injured yet. You can't sue somebody thinking you might get injured. 
you, you have to wait till you have standing. In other words, you have to have been injured in order to sue uh, for claims, for damages of some sort. Understanding, when, we're, when our minds are in understanding, that means we are under the standing, the standing of Jesus. We are under the standing of the word. We are under the standing of God's favor on our life. Look at Colossians 2, 2 through 3. That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, all treasures of wisdom, not some, all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. They are all in Christ. And our hearts ought to be encouraged and knit together with Jesus. That's, that's what we get from the story of Abraham, how, how well he was knit together. Shall I hide anything from Abraham? I know, I'm not going to. Take a look here in Matthew 11:25 25 through 27, then we'll close with this. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. It's only through Jesus Christ that the deep things of God and the unknown things of life are revealed, where we are his friends. That's what Jesus said. We are his friends. And, and if we're his friends, God says about Abraham, shall I hide anything from my friend Abraham? Shall I hide anything from him? No, you know what? I need to tell him about this. And then we'll talk about how Abraham reacted to God when he talked. Because, it, man, it's a great story. And we, we find so many things there about the New Testament mercy and grace of God in that conversation that Abraham has over Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen, I will see you next week. I hope you got something out of this this week. Um, I sure did enjoy studying for it and teaching it. And um, we're learning. Listen, we're going to keep learning because the world needs to know that there is one God, one Savior, one Lord, one Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, and it's Jesus. Y'all pray for Steve for tomorrow. Don't forget. Thanks, Richard. You should have kept your picture on there. That was cool. Thank you, Eileen. You have a great night. Cindy, Bridget, Richard, good seeing you. We should have Richard's picture up there. And anybody else that wants to have their picture on, if you have a camera, we'll put you up next week. Listen, you all have a great night. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Ed, Mike, Richard, Barb, Eileen, Dad, Janet, Joyce, Nancy. See you all later. You have a great, have a great week.